I don't care how late you stay out. Stay out as late as you want. You want to borrow the new car? You want to borrow my credit card? Kids today, they really have it rough. I have no idea where we are or where we're going. I mean, when I was their age, life was easy. Super easy. Why haven't you gotten a tattoo yet? How come you don't have any piercings yet? Yep, we're lost. We are completely lost. Ooh, sports. It, it, just do whatever the mechanic says to do. Vehicle maintenance is completely overrated. Look, whatever the mechanic is asking, just pay him. Pay him whatever he wants. I wish they had soap operas at night. I like that boy. You should date him. You should date him immediately. Well, what about the creepy guy with the motorcycle? He's cute. Yeah, sure. Spring break in Tahiti sounds fun. Hey, make sure you get all your video games done before you start your homework. You don't have to pass all your classes. What? You have a project due tomorrow and you've known about it for four weeks and you haven't started yet? Sweet! Doesn't anybody want to know if we're there yet? Remember, if you need anything between midnight and 4 a.m., please come wake me up. Hey, I'm on the phone. Could you bring the baby over and let him climb all over me? Hey! Hey, can you please turn that music up? Well, we just stopped for lunch 10 minutes ago, but yeah, let's stop again. I never have trouble with my toddler. I never have trouble with my teenagers. I never have trouble with my adult children. You know, she's right. We are ruining her life. Yes, more homework to correct. All right, whining. Yay, tantrums. Hmm, <laughs> vomit. We just really need to spoil these kids more. Sorry, buddy. I don't know any good jokes at all. You're 16. You pretty much know everything now. I think 18's a great age to get married. Okay, remember, make sure you turn on all the lights before you leave the house. Hey, could you leave the front door open for a couple hours? Thanks. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Uh, well, good morning and welcome to Central. Why don't you all stand to your feet and join with us this morning.
Thank you, God. You are a good God. We can count on you. just our friend today you're not just our father but you are our savior and that is who I want to build and continue to build my life on today thank you God amen this is a great day today <laughs> we're just saying all these amazing hopeful words yeah why don't we give a hand to our God our Savior 
Uh, thanks for being here today, everyone. Why don't you go ahead and grab a seat as we continue. It's on. Like Donkey Kong. So this is Lame Dad Jokes. And so what's going to happen, we're going to go head to head. Uh, it's you and Justin, me and GP. Okay. You tap out, go head to head, and we, we say a, a lame dad joke. And then if you laugh, you lose. And so if you okay. laugh, so, so, you, you, so you, the least laughs at the end of the game. So can I dance? <laughs> okay, here's the first joke. I'm ready. What did the buffalo say to his son when he went off to college? Tell me. Bye, son. <laughs> A book fell on my head. I can only blame my shelf. <laughs> What do you call someone who doesn't have any bread? <laughs> it was the stoic nature in which you asked the question. Bread. <laughs> Lactose intolerant. <laughs> Want to know Forrest Gump's password? What, it, what is it? One forest, one. <laughs> Jean Paul, what do mermaids wash their fins with? What? Tide. <laughs> Tap out. I had cheese, but no crackers. I was crack a lackin. <laughs> what? What do you call pastas in Germany? German shepherds. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call an elephant that doesn't matter? I don't know. An ear elephant. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so <laughs> Why wasn't Jesus allowed in any, in any Jerusalem jewelry shops? I don't know. Because they were afraid he would break every chain. <laughs> <laughs> That's so dumb. Why did the rapper lose his medallion? I don't know. Because it was off the chain. <laughs> What's Eve's favorite food? I don't know. Ribs. <laughs> <laughs> what type of car did all the disciples ride in? They all rode in one accord. <laughs> what is Whitney Houston's favorite type of coordination? And I, I. <laughs> that was bad. Did you hear about the guy who farted in an Apple store? He farted? <laughs> did he? It was, did he fart? He did. It was awful because they didn't have any windows. I, I wonder if it's alive in there. What's going on? Nope. Maybe this one. Okay. We'll wait, this one okay. will wake up the okay. soul. This, this better be this good. This better be good. Okay, here we go. Two peanuts are walking down the street. One was assaulted. <laughs> nope. Boom. I'm out. That's it. We got nothing. Uh, well, welcome to Central. My name is Bill. I'm your host today, and we're so glad that you're here. Especially if you're a first-time guest with us, thank you so much. If you're watching online, thank you for being here. Uh, you can interact with our online pastor. And again, we just want you to know that everything we do is driven by a passion. 
a passion to invite people into faith and then to help you grow in that faith. And we believe that no matter where you are in your journey, there's a place for you to belong. And so thank you so much for being here. At this time, we are going to give together. And so if you've not yet received an email and you are a regular giver, please look at your inbox. There should be something there giving you a report to where we're at. So I'm going to invite the hosts uh, to begin as we give together this morning. Now, you may have noticed that today we are wearing our colors. And so maybe some of you are like, I didn't know your English. Have you seen my teeth? Oh, I'm, I'm all English. I'm all English. I also noticed that some of you are wearing like football, like American football jerseys. Um, this is football. Your game is kind of a pass and run game, okay? It's not, it's pass and run ball, it's not football, but the real fans, we love our football. And so we see all kinds of colors out there. Of course, I don't see a whole lot of orange for some reason. You know, uh, well, you know, okay, just, okay, well maybe the Dutch, your color is black this year. You're in mourning, it's okay. It's okay, and it's okay because you got beat out by a nation of only 348,000 people, which is literally smaller than the Niagara region. That's who you lost to, it's, it's all right. And the Italians, you lost to the Swedes. That's okay. And how many Germans? All the Germans, you're excited? Yep. Germans, world favorites. Um, could you get a, I mean, I know Germans are great engineers, but you need to be a little more creative. Your name is The Team. The Team. The German, the te- like, that's a lame name. And uh, Nigerian uh, Super Eagles. Any Nigerian Super Eagles? That's great. I didn't even know they had Eagles in Nigeria, but that's your team name. So we're so glad from wherever you are around the world. My favorite is Adolfo Colombia. The Coffee Men, that's what they are, the Coffee Men. Literally, that's their team name. So we are so glad you're here, and if you're a dad, we honor you today, whether you're a biological dad, an adoptive dad, a foster dad, maybe you're here, you're a mentor to someone, or a spiritual dad. We just honor you today, and we're here especially to celebrate the greatest dad of all, our Heavenly Father, who made us all in His image. And so happy Father's Day to all of you. Just a couple of quick announcements. The first is, that our junior youth camp is coming up. And so the deadline to sign in for that or sign up for that is the 24th, one week from today. So if you have someone who'd like to be a part of that overnight camp, please go to centralcc.ca slash camp and register this week. Also this week, next Sunday, we're having Baptism Sunday. And we love Baptism Sunday here. And yeah, and so if you are here and you are a follower of Christ and you've not been baptized, I have one question, why? Why not? It's an amazing experience as we uh, celebrate belonging to God and to family. So if you've not been baptized, we'd love to include you in that. It's not too late to sign up. You can sign up uh, today at the Great Big Blue Wall. Uh, Make sure that you do that. Um, So we are so excited also about July the 1st. Today is color day, but in a few weeks we're celebrating Canada. In my opinion, the greatest nation in the world. And so on that day, yeah, we can celebrate that. On that day, we're gonna do something kind of special, something we've never really done before. We're gonna call it Family Sunday. So we're gonna have a bit of a shorter service so that our kids can be a part of that as well. It's gonna be really great, Um, a shortened service, and then we're gonna also have bouncy castles and all kinds of fun stuff outside for you. Speaking of that, we have that for you today as well. There's a, a antique car show if you didn't see that on your way in, and hot dogs, dads, for you. We just love to have fun. We love to have fun at Central, and we're so glad that you are a part of that today. And if we can serve you in any way, just find someone with a blue shirt, they'll serve you. If you're watching online, at any point, interact with our online pastor. Thank you from wherever you're watching around the world, and I hope your team wins whenever they play. And so we're in our middle of a great series entitled Wounded, and so we start week three today. So I want you to turn your attention to the screens as we begin today. Great. Well, happy Father's Day. How's everybody feeling today? Great. Can we, uh, can we just one more time show some love for all of our amazing dads in the house? Yeah. 
And uh, like Pastor Bill said, whether you are a physical, a biological dad, or you carry the mantle of a mentor and you invest in the lives of other people, uh, we're just going to honor you today. We do want to honor you today. And so thanks for being here. Uh, today, I, uh, my name's Justin. I'm going to be your, uh, thanks to, to uh, Johnny's joke there, I'm going to be your German shepherd. And uh, repping Team Germany, there you go. So that's my roots. And I don't speak in Zeni Deutsch, so uh, I, don't, I don't speak clearly. My accent's that bad, too. Uh, but uh, like uh, Bill said, we're so glad that you're here today. And we have been uh, in a series. We've been talking about what do you do when you're wounded? What do you do when somebody hurts you, whether it's a friend, maybe it's an enemy? And today we're going to kind of zone in. We're going to lock in on what do you do when you're wounded by authority? Now, what's kind of interesting is all of us, we come from, you know, lots of different, you know, uh, backgrounds, lots of different nations, some of you uh, proud, some of you not as, you know, loud and proud as, uh, as others. We had someone last experience, yellow, uh, what, we said, what country are you from? They're like, Toronto, and we're like, that's not a country, I know the world doesn't revolve around us, but anyways, uh, but wherever you're from, the truth is we all have had experiences with authority, and maybe you grew up in an Eastern type nation, you grew up in a, a country like China or Japan or Korea or India or Pakistan, and for you, you know, your sort of idea of authority is that it's never to be questioned and that, you know, if, if somebody says something, you are to do it, never to think twice about it. And if maybe you grew up in a Western nation, for you, your idea of authority is that they're just a facilitator amongst equals, right? They're just like you and me, and they've been given this role, and maybe even that's your view of me up here. You're like, just another guy like me, and you should, because that's what I am. Just another person amongst equals facilitating a conversation. And so we all have these different ideas around authority. And yet what happens is there's layers that begin to build up over time based on our experiences. We begin to all view authority differently. So uh, for, if you're like me, a lot of us, we've had great experiences. Some of us have had fantastic experiences with people that we trusted and as a result, we're better for them. Some of us, they were our fathers, and some of us, they were, you know, people outside of that capacity. For me, I had uh, a couple teachers that I still, to this day, uh, they've impacted me. You know, I had a, a guitar teacher who was also my music teacher in high school, and for whatever reason, uh, when I was with him, I felt like I belonged, and it was, I was okay, and I could fit, and he, he saw something in me that it just drew out this love for music, and and I love that. He, around him, I felt like I belonged, right? And, and he drew something out of me. And I had another teacher when I graduated college. His name was Roger Stronstad, a great name. And uh, he said these four words, and it's crazy. It's crazy to think the power of your words, but he spoke these words onto my life. And as I was kind of deciding what we were going to do, and, and we didn't know what we were going to do after we graduated from school, my wife and I, and he said, Justin, he said, the PAOC needs you. And if you don't know what the PAOC is, that's just our denomination, the Pentecostal St. Louis of Canada. He said, the PAOC needs you. And I thought, no one's ever needed me. I mean, there's lots of people who could do what I do. And, and for whatever reason, those words, they stuck to me. And they shaped me. So, so we've had great experiences, some of us. But we also have had, a lot of us, bad experiences. We've had things that have sort of impacted the way that we view the world. And maybe even for some of us, it's sort of built this distrust for those who are in authority. Maybe even for you being here today is a stretch because you're like, who is this guy? Like, how did they let that ginger up there? Like, what, what, does he, what does he have to say? He's from Germany. Or like, you know, for, for you, whatever your experiences that you've had have actually shaped why you think those things. And so I was thinking about some of my experiences um, back uh, in 2009. My wife and I, we were in Zambia. And uh, we were there doing just some, some mission work, and uh, it was interesting because uh, I began to sort of get a little lay of the land we began to learn about uh, as we traveled up into Zimbabwe. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with some of the history there, but in 2008, they had the pinnacle of something they called hyperinflation, uh, which is essentially because of uh, corruption in the government, a government that was oppressing people and, and really printing money, they were taking money for themselves and oppressing the people. Uh, they, were, they were experiencing inflation that was going so fast, they were at, I think, 80 billion percent at their pinnacle of their inflation. Canada's about one and a half percent, this was 80 billion. So you can imagine one Canadian dollar being worth two and a half billion uh, Zimbabwean dollars and people running to work, literally running to buy a loaf of bread because in the morning they would wake up and their money wouldn't be worth anything. And seeing that and going, wow, you see the power of what an authority structure can do to, to, to build and to damage someone, right? So, so these kinds of things, they shape us. You know, I, I was thinking of, you know, maybe for some of you, it was a teacher. It was a teacher that said something, and you've been fighting that, that, that sentence. You've been fighting that statement for decades, 
right? They said you were stupid. They said you, you, you whatever, whatever that label they put on you, you've been fighting that label. And it feels like years, and you're like, I just, I know it's not true in my brain, but I just can't fight, I, I can't shake this, this label I've been given. Or maybe it was a boss or an overseer, and it was like, no, it's like, no matter what you do, you're, do, you're trying to do the, the right thing and make the company better, and all they do is see you as a threat, and they're trying to control you and, 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 and slight you and, and try to manipulate you and make you look bad, and you're like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make things, I'm trying to do the right thing, and for whatever reason, they're threatened by you. Maybe you've had that experience, or maybe it was a pastor, you know, someone uh, last week was actually online watching and uh, on our church online platform, and, and they said, what do you do when a pastor hurts you? That's a great question. I mean, what do you do when someone you think you should be able to trust, they, they, they make it appear that it's not acceptable for you to think what you think, and, and they have this strong list of who's in and who's out, and for whatever reason, you had a question, or you were struggling with an issue, or you were working through your identity as a person, and, and, and they said, you don't fit here. Maybe even for you, that's the reason you're in this church today, because somebody did something, and, and you still have this distrust, because you're like, I don't know how close I can get to this place, because they're just going to do something to hurt me. If I don't do what they want, they're going to they're gonna put me out again. And, and so for, th- that's, shaped, that's shaped you. I read another uh, article this week of a, of a father. He, he uh, wrote this book um, about his dad, and uh, his name's Randy Crager, and, and he wrote this book called Stop Walking on Eggshells. And he said this about his dad. Maybe you could identify with this. He says, my dad used fear and guilt and intimidation and blaming and manipulation to control my whole family. He's poisonous. He's the kind of person who has you doubting your own perceptions and beliefs about yourself. Life with him was a roller coaster, up and down for years and years. He'd rage and he'd snarl one minute and then he'd apologize the next. And he'd expect you to forget all about it. The constant instability and insecurity and eventually rendered me completely numb he refuses to take responsibility for his behavior and acts like any rift in our relationship is my fault, and I'm still to this day trying to forgive him. Right? Maybe, maybe for you, that, that's your reality. That Father's Day is actually a bit of a sore spot because your dad was pretty harsh with you. And you didn't know what you were going to get, and so that shaped you, and you live in fear from that maybe still, and, and you have this thing that you're wondering, is this a safe kind of deal between me and you? I don't know. So... So what do you do with all of that? What do you do with all that? Because the truth is we log all of those things and, and psychologists would call that, your, you, you, you kind of, you log it in your fight or flight response. You get enough of those things over time, it makes sense why you don't trust authority, right? It makes sense why when we vote as a, as a, as a province, why 42% of people don't show up because they say, well, it doesn't really matter if I vote because they're just going to do what they want anyway. Do you see how it kind of mounts up? And, and the truth is, I'll rag on us guys for just a second. We're the worst. Do you, do you ever notice as guys get older, we just get grumpier? Anyone, does anyone kind of notice that? As you get older, you have this tendency to be like, everything's the worst. They're just trying to get me and they're trying to rip me off. And, you know, it's like as, as men get older, they just get grumpier. And so, guys, we've got to change that. We can ch- we're going to change that. We're going to learn how to do that today. But, but, but today it's this, this idea of what do you do when you've been wounded? What do you do when you've been wounded by authority? When somebody that should have been there for you, maybe a father who should have protected you, actually left you with deep wounds that you still face today. And I think there's a few options, and this is what I want to kind of unpack today. The, the first, the three that I see are, and we've been kind of talking about them uh, throughout this month, and you could, again, you can check online, centralcc.ca slash watch, and you can catch up if, if today resonates with you. But the first one, I think, is, is you could retaliate. And this is probably our most natural inclination. We want to get back at those that have, you know, hurt us. We want to put on our anti-political music and, you know, say we're going to fight the power and we're going to take the power back. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to sort of do what we can to get what's ours. And we claw and we fight for control. That's our natural. I read, uh, actually, I read an article this last week of... Um, of uh, a guy who last month, he won the lottery. He was in Illinois. He won the lottery, $125 million. And uh, this individual, he decided that same week he was going to spend a quarter million on, on manure. And so he bought a quarter million dollars worth of manure, and he dumped it on his boss's lawn. <laughs> All right? This is everyone's fantasy. If you've ever really, someone's really hurt you. And so he bought... of manure, goes to his his, his boss's house, starts dumping it on on his lawn. 15 minutes later, the police come, and they've dropped something like 10 tons of manure on his boss's front lawn. And so they arrest him, and and he gives this this statement. In this statement, they ask, like, why did you do this? And he said, said, listen, for 17 years, my boss treated me like 
I won't use his word, uh, I'll use my word. He, he treated me like crap, and so I wanted him to get a taste of his own medicine. And that's the story, that's it. And so what's amazing about that is somebody actually uh, texted me and said, that's a fake news article, which makes the story even better, right? Because, because this is our fantasy that if somebody hurts us, we want to get back at them, right? I mean, how, it's kind of a funny story if you, if you think about it, right? Like if we all, if we could do that, we would. But we know that deep down, it's not really the answer, is it? It just kind of self-perpetuates this, this cycle of fighting, if we hurt someone, they hurt us back. And, and, and we know that if you live by the sword, you actually end up dying by the sword as well. So, so that's one option. We can retaliate. The other one is we can begin to retreat. We can retreat from authority. And I think for a lot of us, maybe, I don't know if it's a Canadian thing, maybe a little bit as well, but we don't want to think too highly of ourselves. And, and we've had bad experiences. So, so we say, maybe if there just wasn't authority. And that's a, whole, that's a whole nother conversation. People saying, what would a society look like without authority? I don't have time to get into that today, but... But, but what would it look like if I just retreated from it? And a lot of us, we do this because of our fight and flight response. We, re- we retreat because in our mind, maybe if a prime example would be you had a tough upbringing. And you said, I'm never going to be like that parent. I was never gonna, I'm never going to do it like they did. And so you become a friend to your child. And because of that abuse, in an effort to avoid that abuse that happened of authority, you missed out on being who you were created to be, an authoritarian, someone who was created with incredible power to take the world somewhere beautiful. And so those are, those are the first two. You can retaliate, you can retreat. But today I think there's a third one, and I think this one, this is good. If you, can, if you can internalize some of this, this will actually transform the way you live, and it'll actually take you out of the rut that maybe you find yourself in, the cycle that you find yourself in, and it'll liberate you to be something that is far beyond what you thought you could be, defined not by what happened to you, but defined by a future that is moving forward unhindered by the past, but actually propelled into something beautiful. And so that's what we're going to see today. And, and we're going to do it through the story of, um, of a, an individual. His name's King David. And if you don't know the story of King David, uh, you can read about him in a book called uh, First Samuel, and, which is uh, one of 66 books in the Bible. And uh, King David, uh, you need to know, is, uh, he, he's, he's what was probably known as one of the greatest kings to ever rule the nation of Israel. This is what his, his legacy is. And yet... What a lot of people don't always think about is that David started out as kind of the outcast. He was the runt of the litter. If you were to describe him, he had eight, uh, seven brothers. There were eight sons in total. And he was the outcast. He was put into the field as, as a shepherd. And he wasn't even treated like a son. He was treated like a slave. This was, his, this was his beginnings with authority. Someone that was supposed to love him and trust. Someone that he could trust. His own father treated him like a slave. And so he finds himself in this, in this field, taking care of sheep. And, and in the story, uh, I don't have time to read the whole thing, so I'll summarize it a little bit, but there's a, there's a, a prophet whose name is Samuel. And Samuel comes, and, and Samuel comes into the scene because there's a king who is, this king, his name is Saul, and Saul is this oppressive king who, is, who, who, who has gone against God's way and he's gone his own way. And he's really oppressive to the people. And the people that work with him and fight for him are scared of him. They don't love him. They're, they live in fear of this king. And so because of that, Saul, uh, Samuel is, is going to anoint a new king. And God says, listen, I want you to go to this family, this father, Jesse, and his, his kids. And I'm going to show you who this king is going to be. And so he goes. And, and Jesse brings out all the sons. He brings out seven of his sons. And Samuel says, like, none of these are them. God hasn't shown me any of these sons to be the next king. And he says, do you have any other sons? And so Jesse says, yeah, actually, I mean, I, I've won. I mean, one more, he's out in the field. And so they bring in David. And God says to Samuel, he says, this is it. This is him. And so long story short, Samuel, he anoints David. And David has this dream and this vision that one day he's going to be king. And yet what do you do when you find yourself in a place where you have those above you that are oppressing you and keeping you down, and yet you have this dream of where you want to be? This is where David finds himself. And so this, this is his story. As he, as he grows because of his, his, his life with God and this anointing that he has, he, he begins to walk, and, and he has favor in everything he does. He becomes this gnarly heart player, and uh, that's just what I describe him as, a really good heart player. And, uh, and, and the king uh, invites him in, and he plays harp for the king, and the king loves him. But the king forgets him. The king forgets him because the next, in the next chapter we read about, well, actually the same chapter, in the next verse we read that this, this uh, David, he finds himself on the battlefield, and we know the story of David and Goliath. 
And David uh, says, there's, you know, there's no one who can stand up to the God that I know. And so he fights this giant and he overcomes this Philistine. And yet the king, the king Saul, who has had David in his courtroom, says, who is that kid? He doesn't even remember him. So, so here's David. He's, he's an outcast. He's forgotten. The, the king doesn't even remember him. And then he finds himself in this place where he's building a reputation as a, you know, as, as, as a warrior. And people begin to sing songs about him. They say, you know, Saul kills his thousands, but David slays his tens of thousands. And as a result, Saul, he throws a spear at his head and he begins to, you know, he, he begins to hunt him like a dog because David becomes a threat to him. So you see the kind of cycle? You see, everything for David around authority has been that he's an outcast, that he is a threat, that he is forgotten. And this is the place that I think for some of us we find ourselves in where we say, I have this vision of what I think my life, I want it to look like, of maybe even what I think God wants it to look like. But I feel like everything around me is saying, is trying to keep me down, is trying to hurt me, is trying to keep me from that. This is, this is the place. What do you do when those that you should trust, who should have your best interest at heart, they leave you wounded? This is the place that David finds himself. And maybe you've been there, a place you never thought you'd be with a dream that seems far, far off. And I love it because I was reading the story and... I put a lot of time into reading this because I, I was like, it, it wasn't clicking for me. And I finally came across this psalm and it clicked for me. Here's the cool thing is that David was also known as the psalmist. Okay, so I'll just, just take one second on this. David uh, was a psalmist. He wrote about 80% of this book we have called Psalms. And Psalms are, are songs and laments and prayers to God. Uh, and if you ever find yourself in a dark place wondering what do I need to do, you need to read these because these are these, are these deep heart cries to God. God... Why am I going through this? And this reminder, uh, God is about to remind him of, of exactly who he is. And so David has this moment. Uh, he's being hunted by thousands of men from Saul, and he finds himself in this cave. He's in the back of a cave in the middle of nowhere with the dream that God has given him, and he's a refugee in a foreign land wondering, what the heck am I doing here? And he writes this prayer to God. Psalm 57, if you have a Bible, you can pull it out, or if you have an app, you can pull that out as well. And you can read it with me on the screen. It says this. It says, uh, this is what David's, uh, his prayer to God is. He says, God, would you have mercy on me? Things are so bad, he says it twice. You know, have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me. For in you, I take refuge. I take refuge in the shadow of your wings until this disaster has passed. Okay, so let me just take a second on that. Now, if you, if you read that for the first time, that's not a big deal for you. You think, well, yeah, that's great. Find a refuge, perfect. Uh, but, but, but what's powerful about this is this has happened to David multiple times. This, has been, this is not his first rodeo where he's felt like he's being oppressed. He's, he's at this place again where he finds himself at this crossroads where he could choose to actually fight in this refuge that he finds himself in or trade it in for another one. I got thinking about this image of a refuge because the truth is we're actually in a refuge right now. A refuge is just something that protects you from something that's a potential threat, right? And David finds himself as a refugee in a, in, in a, in a covering, in a, in a tent. So a refugee, I was thinking about this, a refugee is simply someone who has uh, typically an oppressive covering who's looking to trade it in for a liberating covering, Right? That's, that's really, that would be the easiest way to describe a refugee. There's someone who's under a covering that is hurtful, damaging, oppressive, who's looking to trade in for another refuge. And the amazing thing is this is what God is about to remind him of to show him that your wound in this refuge that you find yourself in over here that's oppressive, it doesn't define you. It doesn't define you. This wound that maybe you experienced, it doesn't set the tone for your life. You can let it set the tone, but it doesn't. It doesn't have to. He says you can actually trade in this refuge for something greater, a refuge where there is a heavenly father, which is great news on Father's Day, a heavenly father who fights for you. He fights for you. This is, this is, the, this is, this is powerful. And so, so as, he, as he begins to unfold, the story begins to fold, he's reminded that God is fighting for him. And so we, we jump back to 1 Samuel 24, and we see the story play out. And here's what it says. It says that Saul... He took 3,000 able young men from all of Israel, and he set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. If you ever want to go to a sketchy part of town, that's where you go, all right? The crags of the wild goats. That was a lame dad joke. All right. 
Just a little, there we go. Okay, we'll keep going. Uh, he says, he came to the sheep pens along the way, and a cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. And I love that the Bible leaves that in there. In case you're wondering why Saul's in the cave, that's what he's do- He's just relieving himself. Okay, it's, it's all right. This is, bad. this is bad all around here. Okay, so David and his men were far back in the cave, and this is where it gets good. It says, the men said, this is the day that the Lord spoke of, When he said to you, I will give your enemies into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. It's like this this moment is a moment where I think for us, our natural is to live in this refuge that I described over here. Where our natural is, look at this is the moment that you need to fight for that position. You need to fight for that authority because clearly you're better than that person. And, you know, whatever you feel in that scenario. But this is like, this is the the, the natural where his, his, his loyal men are saying, listen. This is your time. Like, this is God has given them to you. You need to fight for what God has given you. And look at how David responds. He says this. He says, Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And I love his response. He says, Afterward, David was conscious stricken for just cutting off the corner of Saul's robe. You think, wow, so why was that such a big deal? He says, He said to his men, He said, The Lord forbid that I should ever do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him. For he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men, and he did not allow them to attack Saul. And so Saul left the cave, and he went on his way. I was thinking about this principle, and I think this is a liberating one. If you could get anything from today, I want you to get this. What if authority wasn't yours to take, but it was actually God's to give? There's, got a, lot, there's a lot of layers in that. You may, got to, you may have to write that down, tweet that, think about that, but... What if the authority in your life wasn't yours to take, but it was God's to give? What would be different in your life? I think for a lot of us in our natural, we think that the things that I have in my life are all the result of me fighting for them. They're the result of me fighting for those things. And I won't get anywhere if I don't fight for it. But what if in this sort of refuge over here, in this way of living in this kingdom, what if there was an understanding that there was actually a God who's always been fighting for you? And it was never your job to fight for authority. It was always God's to give. What would be different? What kind, of, what kind of liberating feeling would you have? What kind of freedom would you have to know that you don't actually have to fight for it? You know, it's, it's cool. I, I'll, I'll, it's Father's Day, so I can brag on some things if that's okay. But my mom, my, my mom, my wife, uh, who's not my mom, uh, my, uh, <laughs> awkward, okay, uh, my, my wife, uh, she, she often talks about this story, and I love this story because it's, it's just meaningful for our family, and maybe it'll be helpful for you, but she talks about uh, a time when she grew up, and, and believe it or not, in churches, people fight sometimes too, I know, it's hard to believe, but she grew up in a church, and uh, she clearly had a gift, and if you, by the way, if you don't know who my wife is, she's the small one up here, big voice, small body, okay, that's her. And uh, small, big voice, okay. And uh, she's, um, she's amazing. Clearly, uh, I, I love her. And um, so, she, uh, so she was growing up and, and obviously had a gift. And there was a number of people that were singing. And, and in this context, when she was young, they were fighting for the microphone. And, uh, and Mel's mom pulled her aside and said this one statement. She probably won't even remember she said it. Uh, but she said this one thing. She said, she said, Mel, she's like, never fight for the microphone. And the meaning, the deeper impl- implication for that was never fight for your platform. You don't ever have to fight for your platform. And what's cool about it is it shaped her. It shaped her for, I mean, to today. She's, she has this, this thriving opportunity that she has right now. She's, it's cool to watch God do some amazing things in her as a, as a beautiful woman leader. It's, it's, it's awesome. But what's amazing about it, what's even more amazing, is that it never came from fighting for a platform. I think the same is true in your life, that you don't have to fight for your platform. It's not for you to take. It's for God to give. Your authority is not for you to take. It's for God to give. That position at your workplace is not for you to take. It's for you to be given to. Oh, I'm losing stuff. It's for you to be given to. It's for God to give. This is the difference. And the reason it's different is because when you understand how Jesus describes your authority as, it changes everything. Look Look at this story. I want to read to you just real quick. This is powerful. So Jesus, he's out with his disciples, and he is, uh, he's teaching, and, and, and this well-meaning mom comes up to him with her, uh, her two sons, the two sons of Zebedee is what they're called, and she says, Jesus, I want to know, can my two sons sit on you, uh, sit on you, can they sit, 
<laughs> Words are fun today. Uh, can my, my two sons sit on your lap? Awkward. Uh, uh, can my two sons sit beside you on, the, you know, on your throne for eternity? And Jesus is so gracious. He says, you know, it's not for you to, you know, to really, uh, it's not for me to decide that. It's my heavenly father. And, uh, but his disciples, they get, they get ticked off. Like the, the Bible says they get indignant because they're like, who do these people think they are? Like, Jesus, we, we're with you. And, you know, like if anyone's going to be like next to you, it's like, it's us. And like, who, like, who do these guys think they are? Like, what, what, are, you guys, what are you guys even asking that for? And you, and you kind of, you play it up in your mind, but there, it says that they were angry with these two people. And Jesus has this moment. He says, listen. He says, there's this way that you've been living in this, this world, this, this refuge, this kingdom, whatever you want to call it, where you fight and you oppress and you control. But I want to tell you about this other way. And here's what he says in Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. He says, Jesus called them together and he said, he says, do you know that the rulers of this world, the Gentiles, that's what he called, that's just another word for the way of the world. He says that they lord it over them. And what he means by that is he's saying, he's saying they, they exert authority downward and they strongly dominate. That's what it means. It means to dominate. And not only that, there's a cycle because those above them, it says here in the next part, it says their high officials exercise authority over them. So it says they have this cycle of oppression, of strongly uh, you know, o- you know, oppressing those below them and being oppressed from those above them. He says, listen, not so with you. Not so with you. He says there's another way. What if there was another way? What if there was another way to deal with the wounds that you've been carrying for all of these years? What if there was a better way? He says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great amongst you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. See, what's interesting about that is this is not about you becoming a doormat. In fact, if you find yourself in a situation where you're being hurt and you're being abused... I think we need to take our cue from David. What does he do? He removes himself. See, this, this kingdom over here, this refuge, isn't about you being a beating, beating pad or being a, you know, someone that you could be trampled on. This is actually about you realizing that there's another way. This word, servant and slave, means for anyone who advances the interest of others, maybe even at the sacrifice of their own. That you realize that the reason you've been given authority is to allow this world to be made better. That the reason you're at your work is to make it better. That part of your purpose and your authority is to make your family better. That you don't have to be defined by that hurt that you had from your dad that hit you or whatever it was. That doesn't define you. That you don't have to run or retaliate or, or, or sort of retreat from. That you can walk to this and God gives you authority so that you can make it better. You don't have to fight for justice. You can actually allow God to be just. So what if justice wasn't for you to fight for, but if it was God's to give. Because in this new refuge, the only time we fight is for others because we realize God is the one fighting for me. And it's a big difference because over here, it's all about fighting for me. It's all about me here. Over here, it's recognizing that God is for me, but God is fighting for me. I don't have to fight for me. doesn't mean I don't remove myself if I'm in a dangerous situation. That's just wisdom. But it means over here, I actually know that God's fighting for me and he fights for me so that I could fight for others, that I can be a part of redeeming and, and, and recreating a world that God designed for us to have. And so this story, it, it ends, and, and David, he's in the, in the cave, and he continues his prayer. He says, he says this in Psalm 57 too. He says, I cry out to God most high, to God. This is the God who vindicates me. It, says, it just means that he, com- he completes me. You complete me. He completes me, right? That's what, uh, sorry. Uh, he says, he sends from heaven and he saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends forth his love and his faithfulness. And I love this story because it sets in motion this legacy that, that David lives. And the legacy is that God always finishes what he starts. It's that God will sometimes allow us to go through the cave in order to actually show us that he is the one who is fighting for us, that he is the one who's going to get us there, that it's under his authority that we are great. This is, this is the cool thing for, for David, that it sets in motion this legacy where when the time came to be king, he didn't retaliate, he didn't run from it, he didn't have to fight for it like every, every other king had to, a bloody, you know, a bloody slaughter to get his kingship. He just said, God, you got this. If this is your promise, you'll give it to me. And so maybe you find yourself in that cave and you say, man, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I've been stuck with this wound for years. And it's just, it's a cycle for me. 
I feel like I'm a victim. I'm always giving away my power. And I don't say it out loud, but it's like everyone's out to get me. And what if I could actually change that? What if you could break out of that cycle? Would you want it? Because this is how you do it. That, 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 that in this story, David actually becomes known as a man after God's own heart. Because he broke that cycle. He becomes this, known as the greatest king of the nation of Israel. So at the end of this story, David establishes, or God establishes David's kingdom. And he goes on, and he's, his descendants go all the way to Jesus, and he, has, he creates this incredible legacy. So for you today, let me ask you. Let me ask you this. I'm actually going to change my question. What if the place that you find yourself in is actually the place that God wants to do his craziest work in your life? What if the wounds that you face are actually an opportunity for God to do something beautiful that you never thought he could? You ever thought about that? What if the darkness that you're going through is actually an opportunity for God to take that hurt, to take that maybe fight that you've had that's been going on between you and someone else or that situation and allow you to begin to fight for someone else? What? What kind of beauty is God maybe trying to show you? Because maybe the cave is actually a way to begin to see that there is something on the other side. That to go through the cave is to actually connect to a God who is fighting for you. Maybe maybe there's something there. Maybe there's a chance to trust God because fighting in your own strength isn't working. Maybe there's a chance for you to be free. And if there is, would you want it? I think we all do. We all want it. We all want to be free. We we, we don't want to be stuck in a a fight and a flight and a retaliate and a you know, sort of a retreat type of response. We want to be free. We want to be liberated to be under this covering where someone is fighting for us. So today, I'm just left with this this thought of, if you've been wounded by someone in authority, can I just encourage you with this truth that you can find refuge, that the Bible says that whenever whenever you're wounded, I love how the psalmist says, he says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. Ever-present help in times of trouble. So if you find yourself weak, if you find yourself in the cave and you feel like you're stuck, and you feel like this thing's been defined, defining you, it says you can actually reach out your hand and you can take hold of this refuge, this God who is our strength and ever-present help in time of trouble, recognizing that he is fighting for you. And when he fights for you, it's so that you could fight for others. And this is our part in the restorative kingdom that God is inviting us into. And so if you've been stuck today, can I encourage you to take a step out of it And the way you do that is by simply calling out to God, God, you are my refuge in times of need. I need your mercy. I need your help. I need your strength. And he promises that he'll he'll walk with you. You're not defined by this over here, but you can walk in this. And this doesn't have to shape your future. It can propel it, but it doesn't have to define it. And so today I want to just encourage you that you can understand this amazing truth that God gives you authority so that you can be a part in redeeming the world. And Jesus says it's not so that you can lord over, but so that you can pull out the best in others. You can be liberated and you can be free. I think that's God's heart for us today. That if you've come in wounded, that you can be free. This is God's promise for us today. Let's pray. God, I, I thank you today for just this Father's Day. I also thank you that you're our, our almighty, our, our great Father, our Father that never leaves us nor forsakes us. God, I'm reminded that when I fail as a dad, that you fight for me. I'm reminded that you're gracious with me and that the reason you are is that you can continue to invite me, God, into a relationship with you that is liberating. And God, I pray for, I want to pray specifically today for anyone who's here who maybe just feels like they're in a cycle of, of, um, of, of woundedness would be the best way I could describe it. They're just, they're just in a cycle where they fight and they, they retreat. And maybe they've even walked away from their, their sort of role or their calling or their dream and they've left it in the cave. God, I pray that they would actually be able to pick it up again today, realizing that, that, that the cave was never meant to define them, but God, it can propel them and that you were actually the one who was fighting for us. So God, I thank you for that reminder today. And I pray for anyone who's here who just needs your healing touch. God, I thank you that that is what you are as well, that by your stripes that you shed for us, that you came to serve us. You came to give your life as a ransom for many that the Bible says that even by your stripes that we are healed. I got, and I just pray specifically for just my family today, maybe anyone who's watching online or anyone who's here in the room that feels like they're just stuck in a 
cycle of wounds, God, I pray that you would heal them today. And they would experience that just by simply calling out to you, inviting you to be their God, inviting you to lead them, to fight for them, and to change them, God, from the inside out, that they would know that their authority is, comes from you to make this world a better place in their family, in their work, and in their environments that they find themselves. God, I pray that you would liberate us to be exactly who you would call us to be. I thank you that we're not defined by anything but you. You are our great Father. You're our Redeemer. You're our friend, and you are our Savior. Thank you, God, so much for who you are today, our Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I wanted to just encourage you, if, uh, if you're here today and you just need someone to pray with, maybe for you that kind of opens up some wounds um, and you need someone to talk to, we have a prayer team that's going to be here. We'd love to pray with you. We also have uh, some incredible people at Central Connect. We'd love to chat with you. Or if you're in a hurry, you could text uh, Connect to the number 905-937-5610, our church number. And we'd love to help you. And we really want to journey with you. And so today I, I bless you uh, on this Father's Day with the amazing truth that you have a father who never leaves you or forsakes you. He'll never, leave, he'll never let you down. He's been fighting for you ever since the very beginning. And when you trust him, that's the way to be free. And if you find yourself ensnared by your past and your hurts and you feel like they're limiting you, today is this reminder that God is a God of freedom who's created you to be free. You don't have to stay in this refuge of darkness and oppression. You can be free to be exactly who God has made you to be if you simply step into his kingdom and his authority. And so I bless you with that. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week.